Barry. <laughs> say what you say. I call this meeting to order. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the committee of the whole meeting. I know I don't look like President Parker, but I'm his substitute today. Um, before we get started, though, I want to take a moment uh, to engage in a moment of silence to honor the lives lost in our community uh, and across the nation. We want to express on behalf of the Orleans Parish School Board, our thoughts and prayers are with the families, students, school staff, anyone who has lost loved ones to re during the recent tragedies. We want to lift up our entire community during these challenging times. Let's pause for a moment of silence, please.
Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to item 1. Point, uh, just kidding, 1.1. 1. 1. Interpretation services are available during today's meeting. I will yield to our interpreters. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, board members. Good afternoon, Ms. Uh, Mayor Garten. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vic Quinn Pham. I'm here to provide the Vietnamese interpretation for this meeting. Xin chào toàn thể quý vị. Tôi tên là Việt. Tôi là thông dịch viên. Tôi sẽ thông dịch cho quý vị buổi họp này. Nếu quý vị cần xin cho tôi biết. Xin chân thành cảm ơn. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Lena Martinez, and I will be interpreting for you in Spanish this afternoon. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Lena Martinez. Si alguien necesita ayuda con interpretación, con todo gusto yo puedo ayudarle. Gracias. Thank you, and I apologize. Before we move on to item 1.2, can I get a roll call, please? Yes, Dr. Wagner Romero. Present. Mr. Ashley. Present. Ms. Baldwin. Present. Ms. Eames. Present. Mr. Nolan. Present. Mr. Zervagon. Present. Also present, Assistant Superintendent Mary Garton and Board Counsel Ashley Helprin. We have a quorum. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna move on to item 1.2. If you don't mind joining us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. We're gonna go ahead and speed right through item 1.3, uh, which are our rules for public comment. I yield to board council. Thank you, Dr. Wagner Romero. Um, a public comment period will be held before any vote is taken on action items. Anyone wishing to speak with regard to action items on the agenda should fill out a public comment card and submit it to the board secretary. Cards will be received up to 30 minutes after the meeting begins. Um, each person shall be permitted to speak up to two minutes as established by the chair. I will recognize the speaker, ask you to come to the podium and uh, state your full name and address for the record. If you have a group concern, um, we are asking that you select a spokesperson for the group to address the concern. Speakers are expected to be as concise as possible and to present their questions and comments in an objective manner in accordance with good case taste and decorum and without reference or insinuations against the board, its members or school system employees. Disruptions or disorderly conduct at the business meeting will constitute grounds for the presiding officer to ask the security personnel to remove the offender. Thank you, Dr. Wagner Romero. Thank you, board counsel. We're moving on to item 1.4, which is the adoption of the agenda. Do we have any additions, deletions, or modifications to this agenda? Yes, Dr. Wagner Romero, I believe uh, there's a request to move item 5.1, uh, the facilities and capital presentation update uh, to the top of the agenda. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved uh, by- Dr. Wagner Romero, just to, to be clear, the motion is to adopt the agenda as amended. To adopt the agenda. It's been, I move to adopt the agenda as modified. Second. It's been moved by board member Bodwin, second by board member Eames. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Motion passes. All right. Moving on to um, our property committee meeting. I will hand it over to Chairperson Bodwin. Thank you, and thanks for your. Um, indulgence have, we're having child care summer child care issues um so thank you and welcome to our today's policy committee um we have action item no i'm looking at the wrong one we are going to start with our um capital and facilities update so i will turn it over to miss delcor property committee good afternoon everyone board members Assistant Superintendent Garten. Um, today I'm going to give our capital projects update and a um, more comprehensive capital update on our general capital planning that we've made current progress on and how we're moving forward. Oop. There we go. So first off on our capital projects, um, we're making significant progress on many projects that students will be moving into very soon. The first being Rosenwald High School's renovation. 
Um, we're really just finishing up the millwork, um, tack boards, whiteboards, some of those finishings are going up, and we'll be having students move into this building in about six weeks. For the McMain High School Auditorium, a lot of work that just continues ongoing, um, roughing in the electrical and plumbing, the duct work for the HVAC upgrades are recent, are wrapping up, and the chiller platform and the rooftop units that will go on a special platform are finalized. For Douglas High School, very similar to McMain, um, we have a lot of that HVAC rooftop unit work continuing, um, waiting for major pieces of equipment to be delivered, again with some supply chain issues, but not holding us back on our final timeline. Um, the catwalk installation um, for the auditorium use, and then the seat refurbishment is underway um, so that we can preserve those historic seats. Rose Marie Loving Elementary School, lots of pictures here of really almost finished products. Um, you can kind of see the windows and the auditorium are turning out really well. We replaced the historical skylights with the new waterproof and watertight skylights and a lot of continuing work inside. Um, and so we have a slight delay in um, this, the main building will be done sooner than the gym and the early childhood center. Um, again, because of some archeological issues that we had on the site for those newer pieces of construction. So our main building will be done a couple of months before the remaining parts, um, but everything is still moving along um, in the general timeline expected. Again, for um, Joffrey High School renovation, this is again where our career center will be located. Again, a lot of things wrapping up starting to look finished. Um, a lot of final sheetrock being added in place, um, masonry on the new exterior, and also the outdoor collaborative classroom where construction and other technical, um, technical construction spaces, that new structure has been completed as well. Walter L. Cohen High School, again, starting to finish up with um, some gypsum board going up inside. We're starting to pave the new parking lot, so you can see that being done, um, and a lot of the work that continues inside, but everything's still going up really nicely inside. So that completes the capital updates of our ongoing projects, um, and now I'm going to give a little bit more information about our district capital planning, um, where we are and where we hope to be in the future. I'm going to talk about it really in two parts. The first is, this, is the school facility preservation program. This is currently the only source of capital dollars that we have for the district. So talking about our progress there, where we are with our planning, and also some challenges that we're experiencing with this program. And then I'll also talk about facility quality and district optimization and how we're trying to solve those issues together, um, what those challenges are, some strategies we're already using to address both needs and um, next steps for our capital planning program. So first for the school facility preservation program, I'm first gonna talk about what is our identified need for this program. So to take a couple steps back, um, two years ago we performed a capital assessment, 10 year capital assessment of every school facility that is occupied by students in the district's portfolio. That helped us understand what is the need over time for various projects. That is our planned total need. However, we know emergencies happen routinely in this district, um, mostly because we are in an area that is prone to disasters, um, climate change impacts, and also just the historic nature of our facilities. Typically, we spend about $10 million on unplanned emergency capital needs. And so for every year, we're assume, assuming $10 million in unplanned capital need. Um, just to give you for reference, this school year, year to date, we've actually spent $12 million on unplanned needs. That's mostly due to Hurricane Ida. So for every year, we take what we've learned from those capital assessments, and we know what our need is over the next 10 years, which is about $336 million. However, in year one and two of the program, the, ID, the identified need is nearly a third of the total need. So we are starting this program out with a lot of projects needed immediately. And as we all know, we get money annually. So we're starting when we have the least amount of money with the most need identified. So what helps us with our need? It's the revenue that we collect from the school facility preservation program. We collect um, about $28 million a year for this program. And we also started this program with $50 million seeded from previous um, dollars collected in the past few years. 
So we have here a graph of our collected revenue over time. However, because of how this preservation program is set up, it is one of the un most unique capital plans in the country because money is not going necessarily to where buildings need it the most, but money is going per student to buildings to fund capital needs. So if you have a building that is collecting more money than it needs, we cannot use those funds for other school facilities. And that is just the nature of the legislation that created this program. And because of that, though we're collecting about $328 million over the next 10 years, only 199 of it is available for the identified projects. It took us a long time to understand the value of this box in the table because we had to understand by building their project need over time while also planning for their revenues by student enrollment over time. And I'm gonna pause there to see if there's any questions about what available revenue, revenue is and how it's different than collected revenue because it's an important concept for this program. Any questions, members? Yeah, uh, to, Ms. Delco, I'm gonna ask just, uh, can you talk about what these uh, projects are? are? Like if you, sure. a little detail about the project. Sure, so two years ago, we had an architect architectural and engineering team visit every campus, look at all building systems, their age and current condition, and begin to forecast of all of the systems in that school building, what would need to re be replaced when and the estimated value of that replacement over 10 years for every building. And, and these are buildings inclusive of the ones that have not been refurbished or renovated to the same conditions as some of our newer buildings? Absolutely. And is there a prioritization? We're of, gonna, we're gonna yeah, talk there. Okay, got it. Yeah, just yep. wanna make sure this concept, because it's tricky and not like any other capital planning program in the country. I think it's important just to just to talk about sort of why the 10 year sort of hold on some of this money and some of the school facility accounts. Yeah, our legislation that created this program required a 10 year capital plan. And after the end of that 10 year capital plan, another 10 year capital plan. So if there are no needs for some schools within that first 10 year capital plan, there will be no use for the money that's in that school facility account until another capital plan can be made after that first 10 one Correct. 10 year. Yeah. And Meanwhile, we'll we have other facilities with capital plans or and not enough money in their school facility account to cover them. Correct. And we'll talk more about why that is mm -hmm. um, and the general thought and the theory behind that um, framework. And you said we're two years into the first 10 year capital plans? We're at one year in. One year in, okay. Any other questions before Ms. Delcor moves on? I don't think so. Okay, so just to kind of scale, uh, put it all together in one slide, our 10 year approximated revenues is about 328 million. Our 10 year approximated need is 336 million. That sounds good, but when you think about this collected revenue versus available revenue concept, we actually have a really big problem. Um, so of the 10 year rev revenues collected, about 129 million is not available for capital projects because they're in school facility accounts where there are not as many identified projects. Um, and again, the second problem is we are really stacking this program with a lot of need. So in the first two years of this program, we're going to have $108 million worth of need, but only about $46 million available for that need. And so this gets to um, board member Ashley's comment is that we are really gonna have to set some priorities to be able to live within these kind of restrictions. So we'll need to set restrictive capital planning priorities for the beginning of this program to ensure the most important needs are met with the available revenue. For the past year, we've been working with our facility working group through this problem. Um, so we've talked about what a prioritization structure could be for these dollars and what it would look like when we applied them to all the projects that we know within, within the district. And so we created a 10 point project prioritization structure and we're really focusing to make sure that we can, within those 10 priorities, ensure that we're doing the following, preserve and protect and extend the useful life of the school facilities, 
renew critical aging infrastructure, renew, reduce shutdowns, and limit impact to operations and education. So limit the uh, impacts aged, overaged infrastructure might have on school facilities and school programming. And so this is the 10 priority system that we created with our schools over the past year. Those priorities highlighted in green are the only priorities that will be funded in the first two years of this program. We know generally the value if we put projects within these priority ranges, we know the value of each priority, and we will only be able to fund 10, 9, and 8. So again, building structure, life safety aspects, building envelope, keeping our buildings watertight, and also those core systems for water, sanitation, boilers, chillers, fire alarm security, kind of those major systems that if not working, we cannot have school. And so that's how we're prioritizing this money, at least for the first two years. And so just some major takeaways and next steps for the school facility preservation program before I start talking about the other aspects of capital planning. The purpose of this program is to preserve our facilities and especially the $2 billion investment of the federal government post Katrina. If you think about it, we built about half of our school facility um, portfolio in the last 10 years. They're all going to have massive needs at the same time. And so the point of the preservation program was to anticipate almost this bubble that will burst in the next 10 to 20 years because we built things so similarly in the same time frame. And we are definitely achieving the purpose of ensuring that we have enough capital dollars for those needs. I think we're overachieving in that purpose. Um, for all other facilities that are not new or fully renovated, there's approximately a $136 million gap between their needs and the available funds. And again, like we said, that need is more extreme at the beginning of the program. And so we've had to set, the, set those restrictive capital planning priorities. However, in the fall of 2022, we'll be working with schools and other third party stakeholders to review the mandated aspects of the preservation program to define potential legislative changes and not for, and, um, for our non-eligible capital needs, as well as prepare for the millage that must be renewed for this program in 2024. So we have some issues with the current legislation. We're really trying to understand those more deeply, but we think that there's a way to set up um, the system to be potentially more effective in the future and hope to work with stakeholders, our school board, um, in that for the 2023 legislative session. So now we're going to talk about the challenge we have with the facility quality of our buildings that have a lot of need that currently the preservation program will not fulfill um, and we're not fully renovated or newly constructed post Katrina. The majority of our facilities are high quality. Um, however, a handful of schools represent nearly 40% of our total capital need um, for the district. And many of these schools have costs that probably exceed the replacement value of that building. And we'll have to have considerations about um, replacing those buildings with new or full renovations that are needed, but not fully fun but not funded by the school facilities master plan. Again, because the preservation program, currently our only source for capital dollars, is only to preserve existing facilities, not build new ones or not complete full renovations. And as we all know, because we've been talking about it for months now, we know our enrollment is also precipitously dropping, and we need a smaller school facility footprint overall in the district. And so in order to increase our facility quality um, and align to our changing enrollment, we are pursuing the following actions. First, use existing quality facilities more efficiently. Identify our ideal facility footprint and the capital investment needed for future enrollment projections and create a disposition plan for properties that are no longer needed for day-to-day -day school opera operations as we finalize and move forward with district optimization. And again, this is a snapshot from New Schools in New, from New Orleans, New Schools for New Orleans presentation they gave last month about the quality of our buildings and their need. Um, so on the y-axis, you have the dollars per square foot of capital need over the next 10 years. Um, and you can see that we have a lot of facilities who have very low capital needs in the next 10 years. That's tier one and tier two facilities, very, very low need. However, tier four is very, very wide range. So the needs of tier four are very great. 
and they really represent the majority of our capital need over time, as we're able to move away from some of these tier four facilities or find new ways to invest in them fully, um, we'll be able to increase the facility quality overall for all children. And so again, the three ways that we plan on doing that, the first is efficient use. Um, again, most of our school facilities are high quality. We need to optimize our use of them. The first step in doing that is assess all school facilities to understand their comparative quality for long-term planning. That was complete. That's our 10-year capital assessments. We also need to use a facility siting process that strategically relocates schools and lower quality facilities to higher quality facilities while not exacerbating our enrollment challenges. This is also complete. We created this siting process in the spring of 2022 and we'll be using it for future available facilities through this process alone this school year. We place three schools in higher quality facilities starting out with next school year. And lastly, review schools with chronic low demand and their ability to fully utilize their assigned buildings and discuss reassignment or co-location options with those schools. However, I wanna be cautious about this one. Um, this action is underway and being reviewed as opportunities for successful relocation are identified. It is not the goal of, our, of this district optimization process to destabilize our schools and just move them to other buildings without um, working with them and identifying what options exist. Um, so it is not the goal of district optimization to de destabilize schools outside of our school accountability process, but smart decision making when the options arise. And then secondly, future planning. As we move to a more efficient use of our school facilities, we will exhaust some of those opportunities. And addition fund, additional funding will absolutely be necessary to ensure all schools are, high, are in high quality facilities, but there are a lot of other things that matter than just high quality facilities. We need to make sure those facilities are placed in the right neighborhoods where additional school seats are needed and we're thinking about the equity measures of how our school facilities are used and how we need to make adjustments based on inequitable distribution of school facility amenities. So to do this, we're going to be hiring a demographer um, that will also be working with our enrollment team on some additional needs that they have um, to help us understand future enrollment, where future enrollment might be stabilizing or even growing, and also what are those various equity measures we should be looking for and also addressing with any kind of future capital dollars. This is in progress and we'll be le releasing an RFP for this in the fall. And through that, we'll need to identify the needs and potential cost of future construction, and we'll need to begin a cap capital campaign and engagement to collect those dollars in whatever way this board chooses to move forward. And lastly, as our lower quality of school facilities become vacant, we need a strategic plan for their use. Um, a, a strategic plan that clearly identifies our values for disposition and incorporates, incorporate, incorporates community feedback on that plan. Um, this is already underway. We do have a draft decision-making framework that defines these values and criteria that we will be starting to circulate with board members, community members to get your feedback. We hope to have a finalized plan um, for uh, the winter of 2023 and begin applying it to surplus facilities. And lastly, I think this graphic just kind of represents how we're trying to move forward. Capital planning is a lot of parts and pieces. It's not just the school facility preservation program. It is preserving what we have, using it well, identifying the gaps, getting money for those gaps, and then having a community-based disposition plan as we get smaller. Um, and so that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Board members, Ms. Eames. Yes, one simple question. Great report, very detailed. How many schools are in tier four? I think it's, I think it's 11. Is that facilities or schools? School facilities. Sometimes we have programs split among two different buildings, but it's 11 school facilities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Ashley. Yeah, I, I also want to um, just say thank you. First of all, I think I've been asking for this for a little bit and it's a super comprehensive. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that I'm sure may seem a little silly, but they're because uh, I don't understand this as much as I would like to, like to so I'm gonna try to, to get there. T tell me what happened for those 11 facilities that are in your tier four, right? when we get to a place where we're figuring out what happens with property disposition, let's say that we sell one of those buildings, right? Let's say that that happens to be the, the route in which we go. 
what happens to the funds that were in the preservation uh, foundation school preservation foundation program? So nothing happens to the preservation program, but there is another funding source that's just called general capital um, capital projects. And so any money that we acquire through sale of a property would go into a more generalized, less restricted capital funding source. So it wouldn't go into the preservation program, but it would be capital dollars for the district to use at their will. But the but there were dollars that were the school facility account. What yeah. happens to that? Yeah. So what would happen is for every year, we fully fund the school facility accounts based on their enrollment. There's dollars left over yeah. in that year. It gets split between the revolving loan fund and the capital improvement grant, which we have not yet done because we haven't had those additional dollars. So mm. we actually anticipate, um, this gets really complicated, but. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. Yeah, no, it, yeah. it's not fun. Um, <laughs> that if only until the revolving loan fund hits $75 million, okay. which I don't ever anticipate that happening, um, would additional dollars flow to the capital improvement grant. So what that means is, and that's not a bad thing, because the more money that goes into the revolving loan fund, we can use those dollars purely based on need and not based on student enrollment and school facility account. It's extra money beyond your school facility account that a school can use for needed projects. So having more money in the revolving loan fund gives us more opportunities to use that money for needs. Gotcha. That makes, that makes sense. Tell me... Um, how does the issues that we're dealing with right now relative to insurance premiums uh, play a part in uh, this particular, I think, prioritization, right, from your tier 40 or tier one? You know, does it make sense that we keep these buildings? Meaning, is our insurance higher for those buildings that are in need of more love uh, than not? It could be, absolutely. Our adjusters look at many factors. They're looking at, I think we get kind of a double whammy here in New Orleans because we have facilities that are very old historic with a lot of need. Also, we have a very high value of our overall property because of the $2 billion investment. So we're, we are the most, the largest school district with the highest property value in the state of Louisiana. And to assure, uh, ensure to that value is expensive. But definitely the needs of our older facilities and their vulnerability is a is a risk factor for sure and, and does that mean that like i assume you and Stuart are, are talking about what that means in terms of prioritization and property disposition to determine whether or not we really want to keep some of those buildings in our in our actual portfolio yeah thankfully kind of all those things align like bad is bad no matter how you look at it um their capital dollar need their insurance risk profile those things are really aligned um, so there are many factors that are really pushing us to get out of some of these buildings as much as possible. Great. I think the only, well, there's probably, there's two more. W one, 2023 winter is, I think, the timeline that we have right now for property disposition uh, in terms of the, I think, the proposed work that you're doing with community board members, um, organizations, so on and so forth. I know that there's been an ask for this to be expedited um, because of the because of the challenge of some of our buildings being eyesores in certain communities mm -hmm. and there being a real interest of communities to be able to develop them and so on and so forth is there any room in in that uh, tw winter 2023 now let me be clear I'm also very uh, aware of how well you plan. So 2023 may be the right answer. I just wanted to get a sense of, uh, is there any um, wiggle room for ex expediting that? So when I say winter 2023, I mean December 2022 or January 2023. So six months away. Oh, okay. Let's yeah, so we're, we're trying to move fast because okay. we know that community is, is requesting this. There you go. Come on. Let yeah. me tell you, math is hard for me. Um, Great. And then the, the only, I see some folks in here from the community who have taken on building renovations themselves. Uh, and, and we know some of our schools are doing that uh, as well. And so, you know, is there, when, when you're talking about, you know, going for a legislative switch, is there any uh, talks about how we can you know, possibly help those, um, you know, those schools who are taking the burden of, of um, renovating the, the schools 
themselves using some of their own dollars that they have. I would say that is quite limited. We have about two or three operators that are doing that yeah. um, who were aware of the funding that we had available. I think what it means is if we get this right, we will have less of that. Um, where schools can really focus on their programmatic, programmatic needs of their schools. And uh, so I'm hopeful with some changes and tweaks on the edges and additionally finding an additional funding source and identifying its use would really help schools not have to think about that and know that the district can solve those issues for them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mr. Um, Marshall. Yes, I, I'd like to know uh, one. The renewal of the millage yes. in, in 24, mm -hmm. will that have to go back out to the public for vote? It absolutely will. Okay. Uh, so we need to build a very strong case for, for that renewal. And I'm hoping this is what and I the, see. And the changes that, that will need to be made yeah. in that renewal. Absolutely. As the beginning of that, um, ideally, I think we would do the renewal in the May of 2023. Mm -hmm. um, because if we have, an op have a need to do it again, we'll have another option, another time frame. So I'm really hoping that working through these challenges, identifying our need, really being able to tell the story of what our needs are and where additional funds could even go and where our current funds are going, um, I think we want to see, want to show a lot of progress in this first year with projects so the public sees what we're doing with these dollars and how desperately they're needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing um, I think is very important to share with the board, the process you're using, with that citing process that you're using, what schools you're talking about and your rationale for what you're thinking is now so that we're well prepared when you present it to the public? It is the we're same honest. citing process that we presented, I believe, in February and March to this board. It's the okay, same criteria. So you, you're using the same criteria. Same every, criteria. Everything. We're going to make sure we've learned any lessons that we need to, but it's generally the same criteria. Okay. Uh, the list of schools that you're looking at. You, you said that you're looking at three schools. To move Three to schools were identified to move from lower quality facilities to higher quality facilities mm -hmm. through the facilities facility siting process we used this February and March. Okay. So that that those decisions have been made okay. and approved by this board, okay. and they'll make so those, those moves are, this summer. Those are, those are the past decisions yes. that you're talking about. You're not talking about decisions that you you're thinking about for next year. But right? basically, what we'll be doing, trying to move backwards, is for any school. That is in a tier four facility, I will be looking for every opportunity to move them to a tier one, two, or three facility whenever the option arises. So that's kind of the current platform. You can get as many schools out of tier four facilities into okay. one and three. One, two, okay. and three. Okay. I'm, I'm clear now on, gotcha. on where we are. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you for this um, report. I know a lot's gone into collecting the data, especially on the facilities and uh, what might go bad when it's a very comprehensive report. I'm glad we've got that to make these decisions. But you may not be able to explain to me at all, but do you have any idea what was the, the logic behind a preservation fund based on uh, school accounts and enrollment numbers? I don't think the logic was flawed. I think it was we have 50% of our portfolio that is going to have a monstrous amount of need starting in about 2025 to 2040. Mm -hmm. um, and that if this district doesn't begin to prepare for that, we will be worse off than we were for Hurricane Katrina. So I do think this legislation was taking an attempt to be proactive on needs, which we don't see in a lot of school districts. I do think the challenge is how that money gets placed to schools that is less about a district's ability to plan a little bit more holistically, but really looking at the individual. Um, I also think that that is at a time, this legislation was passed at a time where we had a divided district, um, schools at the RSD, schools with the Orleans Parish School Board, and I think there's a level of distrust there. Um, and I think if we've, as we've moved towards unification, some of those challenges that existed in 2014 don't exist anymore. Um, and I think our schools very much understand the problems with the execution of the program as it's currently designed, but I don't think the logic was flawed in that we need money for our, our new and renovated facilities that we need to make sure we plan for and invest for, um, but we probably need a little bit more flexibility in how we use the funds we're collecting. Yeah, because it sounds like it was um, operator-centered, I guess, if you will, uh, but um, <coughs> irrespective of operators having to deal with different facilities. Mm -hmm. 
So what also I'm hearing from you is that, cause look, deferred maintenance was, in a lot of ways, the destruction of the, of the district's facilities. Yeah. You know, Dr. Ducote can, mm -hmm. can explain Absolutely. that in depth. And so like the building I was in in high school had no air conditioning, the heat failed all the time. We had paint coming off the ceilings, leaky roof, asbestos everywhere. So um, people of my generation are pretty sensitive to this issue in terms of the neglect that went on. We certainly don't want to repeat that. But it sounds like ironically, the older buildings with the most need that our hands are tied. So the solutions have created a new problem of potential deferred maintenance if we don't fix this. Yes, and I think the other plan was that it was assumed the district would find alternative pots of capital funding dollars to really deal with the half of our portfolio that did not have significant investment post-Katrina. And I think we're basically showing it's time. It's time to do that. Um, we are very clear on what our needs are. We're very clear on the amount of money it's going to take. Um, and the preservation program, even if we fix it, um, and tweak the edges, it will not solve all of our problems. We will absolutely need additional dollars in, do in order to preserve, to invest in our older facilities at the level that we need. So we can make some tweaks to make it less restrictive and give us more flexibility in planning, but we can't get rid of its main mission, which was to make sure the district has proactive funds for our future needs. But it is time to go get those additional dollars for some of our existing facilities. Right, because the last thing we want is any deferred maintenance mm -hmm. and, and having the discipline to be able to anticipate that and be able to deal with that. Uh, now, now, piggybacking on what Mr. Ashley was bringing up, I can tell you I've been in exhaustive explorations of how a school could possibly use its own MFP revenue, bank loans, grants, mm -hmm. to try to renovate their own facilities. And I would say it's a very dangerous thing for school operators to take on. It's nearly impossible for most operators. I think we've been through this, ex this experiment of trying that. Mm -hmm. Most, especially small operators, have discovered it's not a, a responsible option. Therefore, there is that urgency. Uh, uh, and uh, so we can communicate this, I believe, to the public as far as how we're going about this in an extremely responsible way to look at what is best for the students' money in the classroom in a sound, safe, positive facility. Um, so definitely, I look forward to continuing this conversation. We can't go to legislation before May, but we can talk about with our delegation and all stakeholders, what are the solutions to make sure that we have solved the problems our solutions have created, which is often an, an issue. Um, but uh, one more question, how you know, does the rise and fall of tax collections affect this fund as we've been through some rocky roads with anticipated rises and all of a sudden mm -hmm. pandemic crashes? How would this affect the fund in a very basic way? Or? It funds it greatly. Um, so we anticipate moving forward that we'll have about $28 million in funding. However, it takes at least $23 million to fully fund our school facility accounts. If we ever dip down below $23 million, we will never even be able to fulfill the school facility accounts as defined. So when we lose money, we know what the tranches are to be able to fund different aspects of this program. Um, and during COVID, we definitely had some challenges. Thankfully, we weren't doing school facility accounts in the years of COVID or we would have struggled to fulfill them. Um, but, you know, we're watching the, the projections as, as uh, Mr. Gay receives that information, but it is very volatile and this program is very affected by changing tax collections. Okay, that's what I was thinking. But yeah, no, the, the, the creation of the fund, the dedication of the revenue was an extremely smart, important thing that we did. I look forward to tweaking it, getting it right, making it make sense in all directions. And, and thanks for all the work y'all have been on this so far. And, and it was a very helpful report today. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Vice Court. President, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, well, I just wanna make sure I ask this one question. Uh, to your point about needing to go get the money to ensure that we actually renovate, do the work of like bringing up our full portfolio, what is the answer there? There are a few answers. Yeah. Um, all of them are hard. Um, the first is asking the voters for a new millage. Um, so a new tax, which we've seen some success with the early childhood program. Um, so it's asking for new taxes to be dedicated for this purpose. It is also um, potentially taking out additional loans um, for that purpose, but I think the value of need is going to be more than we're willing to take out in, in loans. Um, but really, I think probably the best option is really making our case to the public of that need and making an, an, a new ask of them for a new purpose. Mr. Vice President, you had questions. Thank you. 
So I think this is longer down the line kind of thinking, but it'll help me sort of brainstorm. Could you elaborate a little bit more uh, when you were talking about um, just ways to be more efficient? Could you elaborate a little bit more on the idea of co-location? Mm -hmm. um, and just off the top of your head, what might be some positive impacts and negative impacts of taking that route yeah, for sure. schools? So in 2011 and continuing on to 2017, we created some basic education specifications or design standards. We didn't build a school smaller than 450 and we didn't build a build, building larger than 1,250 students. Um, as some school programs mature, they realize that their program or their unique needs might not fit that mold. And they might be smaller and struggling financially um, in a larger building than their needs. And is there a way to co-locate two programs in a, in a single building, save some financial stress of those schools? And maybe is there some synergy even between those two programs? Um, so those are the conversations that we're starting to explore, especially with our schools have chronic low demand that does not match the program capacity of their current facility. So is there, we're almost becoming a matchmaker um, would be the way of looking at it. Um, because you can have a lot of efficiencies, not only in shared facility cost, but is there also other efficiencies that may exist between school programs, transportation, other things like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, thank you so much for this and for all of your thoughtful questions. Oh, sorry, Ms. Ames, you had another question? Okay. Um, oh, Mr. Marshall has one more. You know, uh, listening to all of this, I, I just feel like a key to all of this is how inclusive we bring the public along on this journey to understand all of this now is it i mean i know you reaching out to some school leaders and you you're talking to different people but to make that uh more public so mm -hmm. that they can see this is is are you planning for that okay yes right. in the fall that is part of what we're planning for as our major takeaways from the preservation program is i think it's not helpful to talk about our issues just with the preservation program, but we have to talk about our district needs as a whole. And I'm hoping the thing that we're hoping to launch in the fall, which I um, am excited to talk more with Dr. Williams on to really do a community engagement on, is we need to make people understand our shared problems um, and what the solutions could bring to this community. And I'm hoping that next year is, is that community engagement timeline. Great, thank you. Um, I, think, I think all of my questions have been asked, um, my specific ones, but I'd like to talk, you've sort of alluded to some potential changes. First, I'd like to make it clear. This is state legislation. It's local money, right? Yep. It's, yes. it's money that New Orleans taxpayers are paying through their ad valorem taxes, but it's state legislation that determines how that money can be distributed and spent. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what we talk, you, you sort of been alluding to some tweaks or some changes that could make this more effective, and I know it's not Tiffany with a red pen on the in the legislation. I know we'll, other you know stakeholders will be involved, and I'm sure you're already having those conversations. But what are some things that you think might make it a more effective program based on our needs? Yeah. Now that we're into the implementation, we mm -hmm. understand sort of how it's working and not working. Yeah. The first thing I would say is all the changes in the world won't solve our problems because it's really just about finances and need. However, I think that we can plan for the most overarching need of the program by just holding back a percentage of our dollars received for our new and renovated facilities for their future future needs. Um, but I think the thing that is tough is how this money gets divided currently among schools based on enrollment, um, not building size, not building amenities, but just the number of students you have enrolled in your school program. I think that presents many challenges, especially as we have declining enrollment. Um, and so we don't need to penalize a facility because we're having current enrollment challenges while we figure this all out. So I think holding back a percentage of the dollars for the future needs that we have, but in allow the district to be more flexible and nimble with how we would use those remaining dollars for our schools that have the most need. Um, defining it based on enrollment, I think, is tough as opposed to building size, building amenities. It takes much more to maintain a building with a gym and an auditorium as opposed to just another, a regular school without those amenities, being able to plan for that. I also think there's some things that this program does not allow for. 
We are a school system that has many emergencies because of where we are. We have to plan for that. Um, this money does not allow us to invest in swing space facilities that may be vacant at different times because it's all about student enrollment at the time. And as we have schools moving around for different needs, construction, maybe their building is being renovated, maybe there's been an emergency and they've displaced, it totally messes up with their financial planning and budgeting for this program. And so I think it's just those things made sense in a time where we were unsure of what this would look like in five to 10 years, but I think it provides a lot of restrictions and how we're able to use our dollars to the most advantage. And it creates some planning complications um, that I don't think are necessary. Thank you. And so just the school facility account stays with the facility, not with the operator. Absolutely. Is that with correct? The, with the campus, not the operator. Okay. So if you were a school who needed the swing space for a couple of years, that school facility account in the building that you left would still be generating money in its account. Not and if you don't have children in that oh, no, building. Not for if the you don't year. have. Oh, but what right. it means is you might be moving to a school that had zero. There is no right. because they're never because we have to reserve swing space for emergency needs mm -hmm. and for construction and capital planning purposes. Right now we're de incentivized from doing that because we have no money to mm -hmm. invest in those properties to keep them ready for needs. We don't have any funding source for those needs, um, which is a major challenge. Well, I think this has been a really fun program pro conversation, guys. Thank you so much for engaging in it. Thank you, Ms. Delcor, for your attention. Uh, as always, keeping this stuff moving and your responsiveness to board member questions and requests. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you, you know, as the months go by and look forward to early, late winter, early uh, 2023 um, and that uh, public process that we'll be going through in the next few months. Uh, seeing no further questions, I think that concludes our um, property committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will um, hand it over to Mr. Vice President Wagner Romero, Dr. Wagner Romero. Thank you, Ms. Dalcor. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bodwin. We're now moving on. So we remember we changed our agenda a little bit to item uh, or to section two with uh, Chairwoman Eames, who's gonna take us through my favorite committee, the Accountability and Charters Committee. We will now have, thank you, Dr. Marrero. We will now have Dr. Jordan take us through this month's school update. Thank you, Ms. Eames, and good afternoon, Vice President Wagner Romero, members of the board, uh, Ms. Mary Garten, board council, and those of you joining us in person, as well as through um, live stream. For this month, I wanted to highlight a number of the exciting field trips and end of year celebrations taking place at our schools. You'll see from the pictures, really exciting field days, visits to the museum, park visits, and a host of other celebrations. We wanna celebrate all of the hard work of our students, teachers, staff, um, and school leaders this school year, and are happy to see lots of celebration for those efforts. For this month's update, I wanna highlight um, some of the supports that the district is providing to our schools this, this summer, <clears throat> excuse me, to assist with planning for the 2022-23 school year. So in collaboration with New Orleans Youth Alliance and the Office of Youth and Families, our school support and improvement team is really excited to host our inaugural summer learning seminar on June 22nd for CMO leaders, building level leaders, and coordinators. So this full day of learning is gonna feature opportunities for professional learning, for networking, and we'll also be having a um, vendor partnership so showcase. Some of the vendors that are gonna be joining us include the Trombone Shorty Foundation, the Coalition for Compassionate Schools, McGraw-Hill, and a host of others. So really excited about those opportunities. The showcase, um, the specific vendors that will come are all organizations that we hope our schools can connect with to provide them with different supports for programming for the upcoming school year. And we'll give an update once everything is finalized after the showcase at the end of this month. The different session topics that we have range from academic support to operations and are being led by both external vendors as well as some of our NOLA Public Schools staff members. 
We had a goal of 50 participants and right now have over 55 individuals registered representing over 20 charter management organizations. So really excited about the um, attendance. And this is a combination of school leaders, of assistant principals, instructional coaches, deans, teachers, and um, staff across all grade levels. Some of the um, session topics I just wanted to highlight, again, um, ranging from academics to student supports to operations. So we have student-centered academic coaching as a topic, supporting diverse learners. We have school safety preparedness led by the Department of Homeland Security. We have uh, Ms. Delcor, Delcor, who will be providing some training and support around transportation and facilities, and then also sessions designed specifically for this particular population around implementing trauma-informed practices. So again, very strategic on the sessions. There's a host of others, and we look forward to um, sharing additional updates after this takes place in June. We are also working on developing additional trainings for our schools throughout the summer and hope to duplicate some of these trainings for those who um, are unable to attend on that date. We are also gearing up for our annual summer training collaborative. So this particular training will take place in late July um, and it will support or it will focus on support organizations around student support services and well-being. We will also have an organization fair during this uh, training collaborative, and these session topics will cover things such as supporting diverse learners, consideration of trauma on students, re-engagement of students and families, and supporting academic, social, and emotional learning for all students. We are really, really excited about both of these training opportunities for our schools this summer, and I want to thank Dr. Davion Lewis from the school support team and Dr. Shayla Guidry-Hilaire, who runs our uh, department our student support division, I apologize, Dr. Gatry, uh, for their leadership on these trainings and we'll continue to give the board updates in those areas. Next up, I'm gonna pass it to Ms. Delcor to bring our COVID-19 update for this month. So just a few things about our planning for COVID-19 for next school year. So currently our staff and our medical advisors are reviewing some recent, recent changes made by the CDC affecting K-12 guidance for next school year. So we're reviewing that guidance as it compares to our current and understanding what tweaks and changes are necessary. Um, and we're doing that by, we're, we hope to finish that process in the next couple of weeks. We'll be reviewing the high level changes we anticipate making for next school year with our school leaders just to get their thoughts and feedback um, on sometimes when we do this, we realize that there's a level of additional resources may be necessary or additional training. Um, but our goal is to finalize and publish updated guidance um, for the next school year by mid-July. I think one significant change people can see in our guidance for next year is we're really going to um, focus on these COVID-19 community levels and the different mitigation measures we plan to have in schools based on that low, medium, high level. Currently we're at high levels and again, we're all wearing masks. Um, I think that guidance will, will continue, but we wanna make sure that we are more responsive to our local conditions and that our guidance really reflects that. Happy to take any questions about COVID. Um, I have a question that, so um, is, is the vaccine mandate gonna still be in place next year, next school year? So our vaccine mandate was adopted by the Department of Health, um, mm -hmm. and so that will remain in place. I think what we have seen is the governor has made right. changes in how he wants to implement statewide, um, but that does not affect Orleans and the decisions we've already made. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delcor. And as Vice President Wagner Romero said, our most exciting part of the school's presentation, I'm actually gonna pass it to Mr. Zervigon to introduce our um, school that's gonna present to us this month. Uh, it gives me great, great pleasure <laughs> to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Covert of uh, Audubon. In this case, specifically, I believe y'all covering the Broadway campus, uh, Montessori and French program. Um, it's where all six of my kids went to school. It's where my mother went to school, before it was Montessori, of course. And um, excited to hear what y'all have for us today. Wonderful, appreciate that. 
I just want to thank the board um, and, and Dr. Jordan for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to speak today. Um, we're certainly incredibly proud of the schools that we run. Um, Audubon Schools has uh, two schools, Audubon Uptown and Audubon Gentilly. Specifically today, we'll be talking about our Audubon Uptown campus, which is a pre-K three through eighth grade school. Um, uh, I also just want to quickly say this is, uh, you know, my first year as CEO of Audubon Schools. It has been uh, a remarkable learning process uh, in the role and the organization, and I uh, just appreciate the support that uh, our board members and the NOLA uh, the NOLA Public Schools District staff has provided uh, throughout this process. It's been really exceptional and I appreciate all the support uh, provided for us. Um, and then the purpose of this is, is really just to talk about uh, our schools, who they are, what they are. I think you know, what's special about Audubon Schools is that it's uh, remarkably unique. I, I would consider it to be uh, most likely the most unique school in the, in the city with respect to programming. And just wanted to share some of the programs we have and what that looks like. Um, and then just the historical background a little bit, Audubon uh, was New Orleans's first school uh, to adopt the French ministry curriculum in 1990. Um, this means in addition to holding an authorized charter from Orleans Parish School Board, uh, our French program is also accredited by the French government. Uh, it's also the only uh, public school in Orleans Parish to offer Montessori education uh, pre-K through eighth grade. Uh, we have some other schools here in the district now, which we're very happy to see that have started some Montessori programs, but ours is the one that runs pre-K through eight, and that program was founded in 1981. And so there's a decades-long understanding within the community and with our faculty about some really exceptional work that's occurring. Um, and again, I think what's, what's really special about this and some of the things I'll go into as, as you see the presentation is just, uh, I think one of the most remarkable things about the sector that we're in and the city that we're in is that we provide choice. And that we brought, provide our families with, with a tremendous amount of choice to choose the schools that they want to attend. And Audubon has historically for a very long time offered remarkable choice to families. They've, they've offered a choice through Montessori, they've offered a choice through the French program and the arts program. And um, we're very, very proud of the fact that we can offer to this city uh, an option that many families are interested in uh, and that we continue to do that in a really, really exceptional way. So the Montessori program, I just want to give a background on, on sort of what this is, and, and I will tell you this is a, uh, a learning experience for me uh, as, a, as new to the organization. Um, but essentially it's a, a child-centered approach. Um, teachers act as guides, uh, whole child approach to education. Uh, we have a learning community that use, uses looping, uh, looped classrooms and mixed grade classrooms. And so you'll see students of different ages and different sk skill sets. Obviously requires incredible differentiation and support from our students. Multi-sensory education and instruction. And so when you walk into a Montessori classroom, you will see students uh, aesthetically using things, playing with sand, um, using their hands, tactile elements to develop literacy skills and numeracy skills, uh, and a number of other pieces in terms of collaboration. We offer a, a few years ago, Audubon Schools created a Montessori training center um, internally. And one of the reasons for that was to make sure that we were cost effective, but also to ensure that the teachers that we had in our organization were getting truly, truly trained in the Montessori uh, understandings and principles and philosophies. And so even this summer, we have, we have internal teachers that are going through that process, uh, continuing to get trained. It's a very extensive two-year process that requires a practicum um, and for them to really understand uh, what it looks like. Uh, independent investigation and uh, are really critical components and, and pillars um, and allowing students to be advocates of their own learning. And so if you see in the images, you'll see uh, you'll see a young man with his hands in, I think those are beans or sand, and you'll see students using manipulatives to understand uh, you know, what they're learning. I will say, uh, again, uh, being new to the organization, it is, uh, it is one of the most beautiful things that I have witnessed in education is to walk into, especially these lower elementary classrooms and these early, ch early childhood classrooms and see uh, the incredible approach that they take uh, each and every day. It's really, really phenomenal. It's been something that's very been, been very eye-opening for me. And so the benefits of the Montessori education is, again, each child valued as an individual. Uh, the multi-age grouping means that students are learning from one another. They are learning from peers that are older. 
they are, our, our older students are, are learning how to be respectful and supportive of students that are, are younger than them. Um, the hands-on approach helps them to conceptualize uh, concepts a bit further. Um, it's able to help them think critically and collaboratively, move at a, a pace that's important for them, and uh, helps develop order, coordination, concentration, and a very, very high level of independence. These are things that uh, are critically important as students leave our schools, is to have these elements behind them. Uh, and so instilling these into our students at a young age is, is really, really important. Our French program is vastly different. And so if you were to in, in our Audubon Uptown schools, you would see you would, uh, it's kind of remarkable. You walk down the hallway, you've got Montessori on one side, you've got our French program on the other side. Um, and our French program is an authentic program, authentic French school curriculum. So it is not a translated curriculum um, from French to English or English to French. It is a, it is a French school. It is accredited by the, the French government as a French school. In fact, we had a, a gentleman, the director of schools here in France, uh, from France, uh, visiting our site and, and said to us that he considered us a flagship school here in the country in terms of the work that we were doing uh, in such an exceptional manner. Um, when students return to their country, whether that's overseas or they're able to travel abroad, our students take examinations that they pass and give them the accreditation uh, to actually enter into high schools and colleges overseas where they can enter directly into schools uh, where French language is the, um, is, is the primary language. And additionally, our certified teachers, we work with CODEFIL, we work uh, to get credentials, credentials teachers who are uh, nationally credentialed and also locally credentialed, um, and give sort of an incredibly authentic experience in terms of the, uh, the French uh, program. Um, I know I said earlier with Montessori how uh, beautiful it was when I walked in and saw for the first time the way these things were happening. Uh, the same thing happened when I went into our French program, but it happened when I went into a first grade classroom. And uh, maybe I should have known this, but um, I did not know our kids could speak French in first grade when I took the, took the job. Um, and when I walked in and witnessed these students speaking French and listening to French, uh, it absolutely blew me away. It blew me away um, the way that they approach it and the way they support it and the way that the bilingual education supports their students. So uh, remarkably impressed by the work that's being done by our teachers on a, on a daily basis. And you'll see, see here sort of how the, the program works through the years. And so our students come in in pre-K through four and 90% of their instruction occurs in French. Uh, and as you know, and as educators, uh, that you know, language acquisition at the early age, ages is critically important. And so they're hearing this all day, they're speaking this, they're learning it, they're understanding it, they're doing songs, they're using tactile reinforcements. Um, and then they receive intervention in English, uh, and they get your, your standard Eng English language arts throughout the week. And then an arts component is uh, implemented in through uh, creative movement or physical education or even Chinese instruction that we have as well. And if you notice the progression as they move, the, um, some of the instruction will decrease a little bit. K through three, it's 70% in French. Uh, when they get to fourth and fifth, it actually is about 80% instruction in French. And sixth through eighth grade, it drops again to about to a 70% instruction in French. And part of the reason for that is because our students have acquired the French language really well at the younger ages. Um, we provide, we, we are preparing ourselves for standardized assessments and supports. Um, and again, offering uh, our standard ELA um, uh, you know, blocks in English um, and uh, a variety of elective, uh, electives for those students as well. And again, by, uh, similar to Montessori, some of the, the benefits of a bilingual education, um, better cognitive, these are all research-based, these are all studied, these are things that people have known for, for a long time, but better cognitive and analytical skills, uh, increased language proficiency uh, in, in all languages, awareness of other cultures, uh, adapt adaptability, flexibility, and creativity, and certainly more career opportunities. Um, I had the, um, uh, the great pleasure of, of working at a school prior to Audubon. I had a student um, who was at our school who was an Audubon graduate, uh, and when she gradu graduated from the school I was at prior, she went off to study at the University of Paris. And so we still keep in touch, and it just gave her an incredible baseline of understanding and knowledge uh, to explore the world in a different way. Uh, and there's skill sets that are learned from that that 
cannot be seen or, or understood in, in other areas. And so for giving our, our students the opportunity to do that is, is um, incredibly important to us and important for those families. So it's just a picture you, you see of, of just the differences between maybe these programs. Um, on the left, you'll see a student uh, who is working um, uh, on something called WORKS. Uh, this is an independent activity. Throughout the week, they, they have uh, what's called WORKS, where they will choose various activities that are linked to literacy and math and other items. They will work through those at an independent level. They will work through them in a level that is appropriate for uh, their understanding. And they'll work through them uh, and, and find struggle. Uh, they'll find uh, acceptance, they'll find success, and then they'll move on. Um, you'll notice in a Montessori classroom in that picture that everything is located on the shelves in front of our students. So if you were to walk into one of our classrooms, you would see that everything is, is created so that students can access them at all times. It's not an environment where teachers have to provide for students things or they be asked. These are uh, environments where students can access learning materials and access things of interest that are important to them. Of course, during the week, our, our teachers will evaluate and understand the works. They'll notice you know, maybe the child that's constantly picking the thing that they really enjoy and they'll, they'll move them towards other works uh, to make sure that skill development is happening in other areas as well. And the other picture is students in our upper grades. Uh, these are some of our French students. Uh, they were in a, uh, recently on a local uh, television show um, just speaking um, in French, uh, discussing uh, essays that they had written on social justice issues uh, and other elements that were really important to them and was highlighted um, with the exceptional language acquisition that they, uh, they had. And then, you know, one of the other incredible elements of, of Audubon is, um, be, besides Montessori and, and French, is the arts component. And so arts is very, very important to the community. We also know the arts uh, creates um, opportunities uh, for students to be critical thinkers, inter interdisciplinary thinkers in this world, um, being uh, openly creative, uh, you know, a number of things, innovators. These are things we want to continue to foster in our schools. And so from the very beginning, we have our students move through elements of creative movement and visual art, uh, theater and music, uh, visual art at the upper grades, and then off offer also talented and gifted services throughout for students that are uh, meeting those, um, those standards as well. So uh, it's a really, really comprehensive program uh, and a program that our families um, really, really enjoy. Um, and uh, have uh, uh, been, been incredibly satisfied with, and I, I, I think it's no surprise our, our faculty's exceptional, the program's exceptional, and there's a lot to offer. And this last slide is just a, a picture of some of our, our students in the arts. You'll see uh, in a comprehensive manner from uh, visual art, to digital imagery, to uh, students that are working through music and theater, um, and really giving them an opportunity for self-expression uh, we know the arts support students uh, in the areas of mental health uh, and wellness. Um, we know it gives them a relief system and a passion point uh, in schools that they can uh, accrue and, and, and become greater connected to and hopefully lead them to with passions as they move on beyond uh, Audubon, uh, Audubon schools. And so, um, again, very, very proud of the organization, um, proud of the, the work that's been done for many, many decades there. Um, and um, excited for the future. And, and so then finally just wanted to share where we were heading. So I've had an opportunity to uh, lead the organization for this past year, had the opportunity to learn a lot. I'm still learning uh, quite a bit, uh, but also the opportunity to reflect on some of the things that you know we could be stronger in and some of the things that where we wanna move our organization. And so um, one of the things we are looking into is, is creating even stronger academic outcomes for Audubon, uh, creating higher levels of rigor. Uh, made the decision to hire a chief academic officer this year for the first time, really thinking it's important. I'm a big believer in having a champion of people that are going to focus on things that are critical uh, and, and bringing in a champion of academics that can work alongside me to really drive instruction. Um, Benchmarks assess, assessments, professional learning communities, developing content leaders within our own community, uh, aligning instruction across all of our campuses, um, enhancing our math and literacy blocks um, are all things, uh, and including using data-driven instruction. And so some of the changes that we're gonna be making into next year working with a, a, a new CAO is implementing some of these elements into our community, um, professionalizing our staff even further, 
um, building capacity within our staff in our schools so that they have the leadership abilities they can to work with their colleagues and their teams and to move us uh, so that our academic outcomes are even stronger um, and our students are supported to the best of their ability. Additionally, uh, recognizing um, you know, COVID and what has occurred over the last couple of years, we've had a decrease in family engagement. I think that's happened locally, nationally, everywhere. And so a real focus next year of increased family engagement, Audubon schools, uh, for the first time, we'll be implementing weekly assemblies as we return, bringing our family in, families in on a weekly basis into our schools, uh, showing performances, academic outcomes, celebrations, uh, connections, making sure that they're heavily connected in our schools, and then also, have also created a number of community events that have, in addition to the events that have already occurred at Audubon for many, many years, and so really supporting uh, that as well. Uh, another aspect is special education shifts. Um, so one of the things uh, that I was assessing early is that, you know, um, we want to make sure that our, we're, we're supporting our students with IEPs to the absolute best of our ability. Uh, and so we are creating uh, discovery rooms next year to support students that uh, may need some additional supports, uh, may need some additional um, uh, intervention, and may need smaller settings to support them further. Um, many people know I'm, I'm a, a parent of a child with special needs who is in a very small um, uh, setting um, in an eight to one to two. Um, and so there's great value in making sure that our students that require just intensive intervention are getting that. And so we're creating those models next year to support those students even further. And, and lastly uh, is facility improvements. And uh, very, very fortunate and uh, really, really appreciate the support um, from many members of the community, uh, including Dr. Lewis, to make sure uh, that we had access uh, in our application process and were cited for the Live Oak Building. And want to thank everyone who was involved in that. The Live Oak Building uh, will um, offer Audubon Uptown uh, 84,000 square feet of space. It's almost double the size of Milan. Uh, that school has been cramped for some time. It's restricted some of the programming elements we can provide. And that will help us in increasing our arts programs, increasing supports for our students with IEPs, with proper spaces. There's a theater, there's indoor courtyards, um, there's communal spaces, a large play yard, um, beautiful wood floors, um, gorgeous windows, and it's a space that um, our community is incredibly proud of and we're very, very much, uh, much looking forward to, to getting in there um, and opening it up in a really special way. Um, and so um, uh, with that, um, I would be happy to take any questions or comments that the, the board or others may have. First, I would like to say thank you for bringing this beautiful program to us today. You're doing a lot of great things and when you do great things with children, you keep them engaged and highly motivated. My wish is that more of our schools would have the creative movement and the visual arts in their schools. So hopefully that's something we can move toward uh, engage, to keep our kids highly engaged. Uh, with that, I wanted to ask about the French program. Approximately how many students do you have involved in the French program at your site? So I would say we have a, at the Uptown site, we have about 800 um, plus students. I have Elise, I have a, my Elisa here. I don't know if she has her, my numbers for me. It's a little bit lower than our Montessori students. But. It's about 45. That's outstanding. Yeah, yeah, 45, so about 45%. I think one of the challenges with the French program is um, there are, you know, it's a limited pool of, of mm -hmm. families that may want to enter into right. it. And so, retention becomes challenging and the pool becomes challenging at times. Those, those are things we're looking into and working into, uh, you know, working out. Um, but to have 45% of our students in that program, getting that instruction, um, we're very, very proud of, very proud of. And what, um, where do your eighth graders normally go once they leave Audubon? Sure, so we have, they go to a variety of places. So we have students that will go to St. Aug, we have students that will go to Ben Franklin, students that will go to Lusher, uh, students that will go into the private schools, well, students that will go to Warren Easton. Um, you know, many of our students perform really, really well and have some really good opportunities. And so it's a variety of schools, um, a variety of great options that we uh, were able to get them into. Thanks again. Any other questions? I didn't want to, I wasn't going to say anything, but when I uh, see what you said, uh, stronger academic outcomes. Yes, sir. You know, we're all about academic excellence. 
uh, and some schools prioritize that to the point where they suffocate the whole child, right? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say this to, to you to, to caution you because you knew not to push it too far yep. or too, I have a granddaughter and I'm, I'm saying that because I have a granddaughter that went through the French program sure. and she walked out of there with uh, high achievement academically, walked right into Franklin and she's been able to maintain that high academic standard. So you're, they're doing something right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just want to see that continue. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's been a beautiful program for her and I encourage all parents to investigate it to see if that's something for them because it is outstanding, outstanding work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and absolutely, there's a, there's a balance. I learned it a long time ago as in the first couple of years as a principal, there's a balance in what you can push our faculty to do and what's appropriate and for our families. And so um, I, I have never come out of a school um, system where um, we were, um, you know, of a no excuses model or of that of that mindset, um, uh, and and as 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 rigid, uh, you know, and those there's positives certainly to that, um, but but really the thought process moving into next year is uh, making sure that these professional learning communities are developed in a way where our teachers are really becoming uh, professionalized in their craft and working with one another enhancing the, the program even further and, and making sure that our kids are, um, you know, having even, you know, greater academic outcomes and greater opportunities. Yeah, I just have a, a quick uh, question. I think the presentation was focused on Uptown, obviously Gentilly's in, in my district, so I just wanted to make sure I understood why weren't we focused a little bit on, on Gentilly? Yeah, so I was, I was, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. This was, um, we were looking for a school in District 6, Mr. Zervigon's um, <laughs> district, and so that's gotcha. why this one just focused uh, on Uptown. Uh, but I we got it. a bunch more schools to do. Uh, understood. Throughout. They're There's, in my district, too, District yeah. 5, and they didn't talk about that either, so. Do, do not I, worry. I could come back next month and do Gentilly if you'd like, okay, <laughs> but, right, but I was asked to do Uptown. That's why I tried to I tried to cater. I was trying to be quiet about yes, it. Yes, I just yes, wanted yes. to yes. now understand. Yes. No, I'm glad you asked. Yes, yes. thank you. <laughs> uh, um, I can um, I'll echo all of what you said about a French education. My daughter's in a different. My two, two daughters are in a different immersion program, but. Um, truly would recommend it to any family. It's, it's, such a, it's so wonderful to see your kids um, acquiring that language and you know, reading in French before they read in English. Is, um, it's tough for a parent who's like, when are you gonna learn how to read in English? Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> but when you see them reading in French, it's incredible. Um, and they do eventually it, you know, get to the English. Not too long. Mm. Um, but I have questions about the Montessori program. How I, you know, I th I'm more, I'm more familiar with the primary years of Montessori. What does Montessori look like in middle school? Great, that's a great question. So, I, you know, over the years at Audubon, my understanding is that, you know, uh, Audubon has attempted to do a, a, as traditional a Montessori program even in the upper years. Um, and what we found um, a number of years ago was that that was incredibly challenging. Uh, there was it was challenging for staff burnout um, who were managing you know, a third, fourth, fifth grade class at the same time. Um, it was challenging for differentiation of instruction, uh, certainly challenging with the standards that were met. And so the shifts that have been made at Audubon and the upper grades uh, have been more single site. Uh, we have multi-grade classrooms um, for homerooms. Uh, so we still create a community of, of a, you know, Montessori-ish community. Uh, we still utilize all of the elements of Montessori and the pillars of Montessori. Uh, still a lot of hands-on and project-based learning. Um, but we recognize the need to make sure that we have students in terms of support them the best academically to, to be Montessori, but also to support uh, with the accountability measures that it absolutely is shifting and has shifted uh, to um, more of a single grade um, program. So um, 
does it look exactly the same as how maybe perhaps a private school would have their upper grades? No. Um, but does it keep the same principles and elements that are most important to Montessori? Yes. Um, but the configuration of it is a little different. And that was a strategic move a few years ago uh, just to make sure our kids were best, best prepared. Thank you. And then I'll just uh, welcome you. I'm excited about your move to the Live Oak building out of my neighborhood, but still in my district. So mm -hmm. thanks. Let me know if I can help with any I transition. Will. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I just have one, one question, then, of course, comments. Um, what is the current demographic breakdown of the student body across uh, the Uptown School or maybe the entire uh, CMO, if y'all have that, if you're prepared to? Yes, um, I do. I just wrote it down because I was pulling those numbers. I expected the question. Uh, give me one second here. Um, so our so our uptown demographics. We have eight hundred, approximately eight hundred and thirteen students. Uh, Forty percent of those students are free and reduced lunch. Uh, Forty-four percent African American. Thirty-six percent white. Eight percent Latino. Uh, Two percent Asian American. Eight percent multiracial. Uh, special education population is approximately 16% as well. That, that, that's actually um, good to hear that the school is still as diverse as it's yes. always been. Because as you pointed out, um, it's about offering public Montessori, right. public French, high arts curriculum yep. in a very well integrated environment. Right. And those are the founding principles that the founder, Joe Lotus, had aspired to. Right. Uh, you say you to, uh, it's a steep learning curve. You're obviously a fast learner. <laughs> as far as mastering that. But you know, um, I, I would submit to everyone that it's a really good example of the in, importance of autonomy for a school. My glasses are fogging up. Um, the importance of autonomy for a school operator. Because you know, through so many years, the school could show great outcomes and provide what other people pay a fortune for in other cities. And um, then new superintendents would come into town. They'd say, we love what you're doing. We love your, your success, but we are uncomfortable with how you're doing it. And I always want to ask for changes away from the model that was working. So when we were uh, asked to go charter by our elected school board, uh, it was the PTO presidents and educators, the French Ministry of Education that pulled together to create the, the schools, soundly grounded in the community, also as a large international student population. Right. Um, and so with control of your curriculum, with your budget, with your facility, with your calendar, then we were able to get our teachers, Montessori certified and support them with that. We were able to deepen our relationship with the French Ministry of Education. In fact, after Katrina, the French government showed up with money to help us before Washington did. Yep. And for months, I was able to say we got more help from Paris than from Washington. <laughs> and it was true. Yep. We've had senators come and visit us from France and, and, and we always get extremely positive feedback uh, as you point out, students go to other places, they find that they're extremely well prepared. So um, this model of a community-based, community-run, uh, uh, independent, you know, autonomous school, I'd say it's a textbook example as to why this can work, how it should work. Um, it was great to have you all here today um, and, and keep up with the good work. It's great to have you. And that's, you're only the fourth um, person to ever run Audubon, and uh, so we're so excited that you're there. Uh, yeah. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate that very much. Thank you all, appreciate the opportunity. I wanna say thank you again to Dr. Corbett for the presentation today, and actually as he was talking, um, it made me remember that this is actually the last school for the first full year that we've had our schools come to present at our um, schools committee meeting. So I wanna just take the opportunity to thank every single school that has taken time out um, to create presentations for the board, for the community, for the district, um, because we know that, you know, it's no easy feat given the competing priorities. And we definitely have a goal to get to every single school and cover every single board member's um, <laughs> district as we continue this, um, as we continue the school's update going into next year. So thank you, and this concludes our school's update for this month. Uh, Dr. Jordan, before you, um, oh. uh, uh, excuse me, Chairwoman. Uh, Eames, can I get a point of personal privilege? Thank you so much. I apologize. Trying to make sure I'm following the rules here. <laughs> um, there, there has been a lot of traumatic events that have taken place over the last couple of weeks relative to graduation. Uh, and, and so I just wanted to um, 
Can you speak to the work that the district has done to be responsive to uh, these issues relative to the trauma that our young people have been facing? Because even though graduation has happened, I know the work that you all continue to do is, is ongoing. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. As you've heard um, in a couple of our schools presentations over the course of the year, supporting our schools and ensuring that they have opportunities for trainings um, around trauma-informed practices, ensuring that they get um, opportunities to engage with the different organizations in our city that can provide them with um, additional mental health supports has been ongoing work of ours. Um, last month, I know we talked a little bit about um, in the system wide needs program, how we were hoping to um, continue one of the contracts to provide additional supports to our schools next year through Akaban. And so you all um, did support that, which we're really excited about. We, um, on the heels of last week, we did also have an opportunity to leverage Children's Bureau, one of our partners, to provide some crisis response um, to our schools. And we've had a number of trainings over the past year, not only for our schools, but also district staff to support our schools through different crisis events. Um, gosh, I could go on and on. We also have done a lot of coordination with Children's Hospital, the Coalition for Compassionate Schools, which used to be the Trauma-Informed Learning Collaborative, the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, and a host of other organizations to really figure out like where some of the gaps are um, and how we can plug and make sure we're being really strategic around the supports that we provide to schools. In addition, as I mentioned in the school's update, um, we have the Department of Homeland Security that's gonna be providing a training on June 22nd at that seminar, at our summer learning seminar, and we're looking for additional opportunities for that group as well as others to come and support us um, as we help our schools kind of really reflect on and refine the plans that they are required to have. Yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, the, the hardest thing about being an elected school board member is not necessarily the 300 plus page binder that you all provide to us, which we're so grateful for. Uh, it's not the communicating with uh, the media as much as, you know, I can't say that I enjoy it, uh, but thank you for what you all do. Uh, it's not, you know, dealing with my colleagues. Uh, I'd say it's the, the too many moments of silence mm. that we take at the beginning of these meetings. It's too much. And, um, you know, I know we're probably really somber and we're trying to, I think, you know, push through here, uh, but there's been a lot that's been happening in our district and in the districts around the country. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanna say, you know, as we try to prioritize as much as we can, the, the mental health and, 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 and support for not just our students, but staff, uh, families, um, you know, we just want to say thank you and continue to uplift it and talk and normalize it in a way uh, that it will start to combat the silence uh, that we take. So um, thank you. It was on my mind. So I know it wasn't part of your presentation. I know you wasn't, you weren't prepared for that, but I just wanted to make sure I brought it up. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'll just say too, you know, we know that there's no one size fits all approach um, for the different situations that we've um, unfortunately had to experience over the past year. But one of the things that I mentioned in my response was coordination. Um, and I think we play an important role in coordinating with um, the different or some of the different organizations that I've named, our local officials, and you know, kind of as we see, see fit, advocating um, even at the state and potentially national level to ensure that we do have um, as much of the kind of support and resources that we need um, to tackle something that's really, really tough. So I appreciate the question. Anybody else? Okay, this concludes our update. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Next, we will have Mr. Smith for this month's accountability update. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero, uh, Ms. Eames, uh, board members, Ms. Garden, and members of the audience, thank you for your time today as I present our accountability updates.
something on the screen. There it is. As normal, we start with our notices of noncompliance. Uh, there have been a, there have not been any changes to our notices since our last um, since our last meeting last month. But I will go into detail on the the, the two that I've been providing regular updates on. Um, the first one is bricolage. Uh, regarding their open notice of noncompliance level two, the goal was to bring the deficiencies of their um, SPED files into compliance by May 25th. As a follow-up to that date, our team um, conducted a return visit this past Thursday, uh, a couple Thursdays ago on May the 26th, and um, did a full review of 25 files. Of those 25 files that were randomly selected, we found that Bricolage had made very good progress from where they were last fall, um, with eight out of 11 rubric components found to be in compliance. The systematic issues that led to the level two notice of noncompliance had been, has been resolved by the school, so we're proud of that progress that they've been able to make. Um, the, pre the present concerns are related to student-specific issues, and we're working um, with them to provide for us some documentation and paperwork. Uh, they were given until tomorrow uh, which to, to submit some clarifying information on those particular students' files um, and additional support and documentation and then until June 30th to, to address any remaining student-specific issues that they may have. Um, that basically boils down to um, what's happened is that in, in their transition over the last couple of years, there's different systems that they've had in place for collecting, whether it's the, um, whether it's collecting the, the, um, the service providers providing their reports and just getting them to a place to where they're standardizing that information so that it all looks the same, um, so that it's all presented in the same way and so that it's all meeting the metrics that we have. So that's just one example of some of the, the student-specific things that we've been able to find that we will go back to readdress. Um, given that, we're gonna leave the level two open um, until we do our annual site visit that'll happen with them this fall. A couple updates on Martin Luther King. Um, their goal overall was to, to, to bring all, all, all um, their deficiencies into compliance by the September 22nd deadline when their um, annual site visit will be scheduled. Uh, through May, MLK had reviewed all of its IEP files, and as reported by their third-party um, contractor, they have corrected 14 of the 17 file components across all files. So this is up from the six that were um, corrected as of last month. Our team will conduct a midpoint audit um, of 25% of their files later this month, and then um, updates as it relates to their open facilities notice of noncompliance. Friends of King, they requested um, to demolish and remove the mod modulars that there were concerns with, and have been given 30 days to execute a contract to do so. Um, also, with um, as far as the work that needs to be done with that contract, they'll have until the start of the school year to get that work completed. NOLA Public Schools will secure a contract to repair the broken glass and cracked exterior tiles that were present and will deduct those repair costs um, from their MFP to, uh, to cover that cost. A few updates on contracts. Uh, Mr. Smith, before sure. you move on. Sure. I, can go back. Um, I just, you did an excellent job of having a recitation of the facts relative to the issues. Mm -hmm. It'd be really good if we could get a representative from Bricolage and MLK here to talk about these open noncompliance issues and not have you have to provide the recitation of the facts although you did so so eloquently and graciously and you know i just want to i just want to say that uh, i don't know what you're going to do with that <laughs> i don't even know if you can do anything but i just want to say it'd be good for them to be here uh in, in these moments yeah. so we can we can offer that to them for the july's update and then they can come and then um if, if they if they so choose we can do that we can we can extend that to them Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would I would like to 
to have some written description of what these, uh, I mean, I'm looking at Waltel Coin with Child Fine elevated to ICAP, uh, been since two, uh, 2019. So, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to know what's the substance of that uh, mm -hmm. and how critical an issue is it. Uh, Sure. I mean, we, we can provide it. Um, the I know that Dr. Gidry and her team had been working with the state. Those were state level pressed, um, state level issued uh, notices, and we can we can provide a, a, a more specific update to the board on to the exact standing of each of those. Uh, and I, you know, I've been to the, the the state's website and I tried to find out what those things were. Mm -hmm. and not very helpful. Okay. Uh, so if if you could have the state. You know, whatever they send the school, copy us so that we can know exactly what what they're asking the school for and the importance of it. Yeah, we can provide that information to the okay, board. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. So our contract updates. Uh, Breakthrough Education was selected last year through an RFP process to provide secondary education. Um, at the Orleans Juvenile Justice Center and the, Ju um, the Juvenile Justice Center and Intervention Center at the Travis Hill Schools. Uh, the district has been pleased with this performance and seeks a one-year extension as permitted in the original contract. Uh, you'll see an agenda item later on that recommendation uh, later in the board meeting. Similarly, the Learning Collective was selected last year through a RFP process to serve as the district's third party independent evaluator uh, that state law requires us to hold annually. The district has been also pleased with their uh, performance and is seeking a one year extension of that contract as well. And the third ch uh, charter update is uh, significant educators, which operates uh, Mary Bethune Elementary School seeks to change its selection regarding participation in its school employees and retirement systems. Uh, Bethune has been participating in TRSL as we know it and will continue to do so. But what this amendment would do is permit them also to participate in the Louisiana School Employees Retirement System, or LASERS, uh, representative of their, um, they use fourth sector as their uh, human resources, their back of house to support that. And they had worked with the state uh, prior prior to the pandemic starting and got this process started and just through the through the through those and the transitions over the last couple of years we're, we're bringing that now to make that amendment to their charter uh, so that they be permitted to continue to permitted to use lasers as part of their one of their um, elective retirement um, options for their personnel uh, there's also an amendment um, and there'll be an item coming up in policy for that as well Our policy update and revisions. Uh, the following policies were presented to you uh, last month um, with our notices of intent of, propose, of change proposals that we were gonna have. These proposed changes were developed over the last several months through a working group composed primarily of school leaders, but also other partners or organizations. We offered sessions at the end of April and in early May for community members and other school leaders to learn more about the proposals and to share their feedback. Um, that the broader public was also able to access a survey online to ask questions and provide feedback on those proposed changes. I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about the SPRI since that wasn't an initial as we brought it prior. Uh, the School Performance Renewal Index, or SPRI, is the calculation we use to determine the charter renewal el eligibility. The current method is the calculation of the weighted averages of SPS components, um, as you'll be able to see. As you can see uh, at this on the table that's listed here, um, our proposal is to simplify that calculation, making the SPRI the more favorable of the either the most recent SPS score or the average of the two most recent SPS scores for for schools in their first renewal cycle. For schools in their second and subsequent renewal cycles, the SPS, um, the SPRI would be the average of the two most recent SPS scores. Back. 
So that's the, the slide on the SPRI and the calculation. So that was one of the only one that we didn't bring as the, the, as the notice of intent at the last board meeting. So I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail about that one. The remainder of the proposals were um, presented to you last month by Ms. McCarver, and you have them in your meeting materials. So I'm not gonna go through each of these policy changes again, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And just an, and then as a note that the proposals will be presented to you at the July meeting for a second reading um, and for your, for, your vote on, for your vote on the approval or not. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take any at this time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions, board members? I, I Mr. Would like, Marshall. I would like to know, uh, spelled out, you know, when you, when you are evaluating the school, you know, what the criteria for, what, what's the criteria for interest and opportunities? What does that mean? Okay, also ACT work keys. I'd like to have, you know, language around, you know, what you're looking for and how you go about uh, making those assessments. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah so we can provide that information. The, those, those categories are calculated, are the cal components of the SPS that the state uses to calculate the SPS score of the school, but we can provide some additional information on each, on each one of those components. Right. For now, you. How you go about using those in your assessment practices. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Eames. Thank you, board. I tried so hard to stay still. My apologies. Thank you. Um, at Dr. Wagner Romero, we are at item 2.3. Okay, perfect. Revision to 2021-2022 employment ca calendar for central office personnel. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the revised 2021-2022 employment calendar for central office personnel, which includes the Ju Juneteenth holiday. May I have a motion to move item 2.3 to full board? So move. Second. It has been moved by Mr. Ashley and seconded by Dr. Moreno. Is there any public comment? Having no public comment, any board comment? It has been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing no op opposition, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Great. Moving on to policy, Dr. Wagner. Moreno, you're going to take this? Yes, got it. Thank you, Board Member Eames. We're going to go right through uh, Section 3, Policy. Um, I'll be filling in for President Parker. We're on Item 3.1, which is First Reading, Amendment to Policy HB, Oversight and Evaluation of Charter Schools. This item is listed here as a first reading. There's no action today. But, w but this will come back for a vote next month at our July meeting. Moving on to, act uh, to item 3.2, first reading, amendment to charter school accountability framework. Um, this item is also here as a first reading. There is no action today, and it will come back for a vote at next month's July meeting. Moving on to... Um, action item 3.3, amendment to OPSB policy GBRL holidays. 
it is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board suspends its ordinary procedures for policy adoption pursuant to OPSB policy BD and approves the amendment to policy GBRL holidays to add Memorial Day and Juneteenth um, to add Memorial Day and Juneteenth uh, on its list of minimum holidays for 12 month employees. May I have a motion to move item 3.3 .3 to full board? So move. Yes, second. Moved by uh, President uh, Mr. Ashley, seconded by Mr. Zervagon. Is there any public comment? Any board comment? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. The ayes have it. All righty. We're now moving to section four, uh, and I'm going to pass on the mic to uh, board member Ashley. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero. We're now at the time of the hour where we ask you to sit back and relax. <laughs> We're going to be with you for a minute. Uh, budget and finance. So uh, 4.1 budget finance update. Uh, Mr. Gay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, board members, New Orleans Public School stakeholders. We have our finance report. I feel like this is karma, this Mr. Is Gay. I feel like we, thought, we yeah. talked about this last time. Did we not get a, a, a pool going for a new clicker? It's new, yes. That's the new clicker? Oh, yes. No. Problem, problem is it's the old person <laughs> operating it, so <laughs> that's the real issue there. Okay. All right, for our agenda, we have uh, financial statement uh, items, an update on the sales tax trend, the FY23 budget timeline. The levying of millages for 2023, uh, an update on our revenue anticipation note, and uh, insurance renewals. Okay. Uh, with regard to the financial statements uh, for the month of April 2022, our revenues for the month were 1.948 million, and we're 64 percent over the budgeted revenues of just under 1.2 million. Our expenses for the month of 2.2 million were 19% over the budget expenditures of 1.886. And overall for the month of April, the deficit of $302,973 was less than the budgeted deficit of $695,424. And after our transfers in, the net change in fund balance for the month of April was $141,146. Overall for the year to date, our revenues of 14.476 million are 10% over budget, and our expenses of 19.1 million are 13% under budget. And we're getting into the time of the year where if we had uh, enough of a forecast to make a budget amendment, we would bring that to the board. Currently, we don't see that happening. Again, our biggest issue and challenge are those sort of below the line transfers uh, for the board's information. We still don't have the student counts from 2-1 yet from the state, so we're not able to finalize MFP at this point for June, do that final reconciliation which could result in such an issue moving forward. So just to, just to make the board aware of that. Uh, overall, the balance sheet, we have $111,880,300 in total assets, and of that, 68.5 in total liabilities and 43.3 million in total fund balance. Uh, the month of April was great for sales tax collections. Uh, for the year, we've had fees. Again, our fees are 1.6% to the city, uh, total 1.8 million, but the payment that we received was $14.5 million, which is a significant increase. We haven't been over 14 million, uh, with the exception of the January payment, which is also an accumulation of any back payments for the prior calendar year. So January is always a little bit high, but overall for this fiscal year, we're averaging 11.8 million in sales tax collections monthly as compared to FY21, where we averaged 8.9 million. So that's a positive effect for us. With regards to the budget approval timeline, uh, we've done the May 18th and 19th meeting. On Thursday, we'll have the public hearing uh, for the FY23 New Orleans Public Schools 
general fund and special revenue fund budgets, and then after that, the uh, opportunity for the board to adopt that budget uh, for fiscal year 23, or 2023, 20, excuse me. And then after that, we'll get to work on the capital budgets and look to bring that to the board for approval in the month of August. And all of our budgets are due to submission to the state uh, by September 30th, 2022. There's a resolution today for the levying of millages. This is uh, outside of anything that changes the millages. This is just saying that these are our current rates and these are what we will be putting on the tax rolls for next year. Uh, we, of course, have the constitutional millage purposes, A, B, C, and D, which are dedicated, and capital repairs millage of 4.97. That was the one most recently discussed uh, in Ms. Delcourt's presentation as far as what feeds the school facility preservation program in addition to that 0.13% of the sales tax carve out. So overall, the millage rates for 23 that are being set are 45.31 mills. Uh, before we get to the insurance renewal, just wanted to give you an update on the, the RAN, that's the revenue anticipation note. Uh, we're about to pay the $65 million off for the borrowing for this fiscal year. That's due by the end of the month, and we have the, uh, the funds ready to make that payment. We're going through that process right now uh, with Ms. Veal and her team. Uh, for the next year, what we're doing is some cash forecasting. We are seeing an increased amount of MFP that will pass through of about $20 million. So we're considering that, uh, also balancing that with the increase that we're seeing in sales tax collections and coming up with the forecast that we'll put together. Uh, the process works, we create an RFP uh, in partnership with PFM uh, and our bond council. We bring that RFP to the market and then for the July 26th board meeting, we'll have an authorizing resolution uh, that then goes to the state bond commission. After the state bond commission, we would come back to the board to adopt that sale resolution in September. And that timeline is adequate for now. We don't see any cash flow issues again. Last year, we didn't accept the cash until uh, I believe in October. And so we see a similar situation happening for this year. If we had to rush it at all, we would need to ask for a special meeting after the State Bond Commission meeting, which is on August 18th, the same day as the OPSB meeting. So we couldn't do those simultaneously. So we would bring it to the board for the September 22nd meeting for the revenue anticipation note. Probably a similar amount. Again, this year we borrowed 65 million and we borrow the whole amount as opposed to doing it in tranches. Uh, and so we took the full 65, we had a fixed interest rate and we had that money to use uh, until the end of the, of the fiscal year. As we get into the insurance renewal, uh, we certainly had um, a bit of a shock last week when we got the initial numbers. These are not finalized. Uh, we have not received the final figures for this as of yet, but those were the uh, estimates that were provided to us. This is not only property insurance, but it's also every one of our other insurance policies that the school board obtains. Uh, there's a number of market conditions and renewal considerations, but if you live in New Orleans, then you're probably also experiencing this in your personal life uh, between flood rates and, and insurance rates. Uh, 2021 was the second largest year of losses. Uh, reinsurance costs have gone up. Reinsurance costs are on top of regular insurance and those folks don't normally pay out and they've had to pay out because of how much the losses have been uh, in this area. With regards to facilities overall, when we have unrepaired store and damaged buildings, those are looked at obviously as a greater uh, issue as far as uh, dealing with our properties and then the older properties that are not hardened or considered hardened uh, adds to the risk associated with our policies. We've also had a number of, uh, number of markets pull out from the Gulf Coast region, uh, Amrisk and Canopius, which is previously our lead insurer. And uh, one of the big pieces with this is our deductible is changing as well. This year it was 2%, so for Ida, uh, that was a 2% deductible issue. And we had a cap of $12.5 million per occurrence, and that's being taken away as well. Uh, it's something we may have had uh, for longer than expected, but it was a great benefit to us. So. Uh, we've got a lot more risk, and so we've got to start looking at potentially different alternatives to our overall program. We can't do it right now, but it is something that we should consider along with everything else that we're discussing for buildings uh, for the district, because if we're going to pay this much in premium, then we can look at potentially some different options, self-insurance with reinsurance on top on our own, 
um, and what that might look like, but that does take a while to set up that type of program. But it's certainly worthy of the discussion and consideration, and more than likely will be a high focus in some of our working groups uh, moving forward. So this is what we have currently uh, on our expiring and our proposed program costs. Again, these aren't finalized, so there's asterisks and uh, highlights on here. The asterisk means that uh, those are estimates only and not firm. And then the highlights mean that those lines are also subject to a 4.85% surplus lines tax. So it, that's not just that number. We're going to increase that by 4.85% on top of that. So that's several hundred thousand dollars more on top of these premiums uh, that we've received the initial proposal for. So uh, as soon as we got this information, we took a scan through the program. Um, our risk person, uh, Tracy Griffin Robertson has been uh, <laughs> at this and bringing this to market for a long time in conjunction with Gallagher, our broker. Uh, and so they're still working furiously on, on what they can do, but we don't have a lot of triggers to lower it. Typically, you know, you, as an individual, you would take on more deductible, um, you know, to deal with a higher premium. We don't really have that option at this point because it's already gone from two to 5%. So uh, we have some real challenges there. We communicated this immediately to school leaders on Friday and had a call with school leaders yesterday to take any questions or just understand where uh, people's heads were on this. But, um, you know, not a whole lot yet. Again, just waiting to see the final uh, rate and what that means. We also have fewer students last year overall or uh, next year overall. And so that would, in addition to the higher premium, uh, mean a higher per pupil amount that's taken out of uh, the school's MFP as a building usage fee. So. Not a lot of great news on the uh, on the insurance front uh, for the schools and for the district here, because we insure of our total premium, the portion that we pay directly is for this building and our vacant properties throughout the city. So it affects us, obviously, as well. We're all in the same boat with this. So uh, with that, happy to take any uh, questions on the finance presentation. Colleagues, do we have any questions? Ms. Zervigan? Just on the insurance. Um, this has been such an issue for so long. Um, and, and I, I want to just remind everybody of the history and, and, and commend the district on its work in this area. And that at first, when we moved towards all charter, there was all kinds of questions about how we were going to arrange insurance with the operators be responsible for that. Would we do it collectively as a district? Uh, we, just, we chose to do it collectively. Um, I remember often members of the district staff having to travel even I think to England to talk to Lloyds of London looking right. for someone to insure us and looking for the best rates. I know that y'all have always done very strong work in that regard for the schools to, to put as much money in the classroom as possible. Um, I do hear you saying that with the number, like the homeowners are facing, with the number of providers, with the, up, with the going to 5% for everyone, with the loss of the cap, which seems extraordinary. It is. Um, I, I, I hear you all loud and clear. Uh, I look forward to your explorations in the next, say, three years as to what we might do. And I'm sure that, that uh, our, our regional superintendent's organization, our regional school boards association chapter, I'm sure that we can put our heads together from Lake Charles to Baton Rouge to Plaquemine to try to come together to figure out what we all can possibly do. Because we know we're not alone in this, but... Um, That's right. Thank you for, your, for, that, for the presentation today. I don't know if you have any thoughts or, on that. Well, there's certainly some options. They do take a while to, you know, to go through what those, what those could be, but um, it's just a lot. It's just a lot of money, and you, know, you hate to pass that along, but you know, that's, that's how this piece goes. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's a lot of money. I would not like to be on the charter school end of this, again, for you know, yet another increase for not a lot more. Um, but continue to harden the buildings, continue to uh, do our maintenance and our capital improvements. And, you know, we have a high rate. We also had to increase our, our TIV, our total insured value, uh, because insurers were looking at what we're stating as values and thinking those aren't even high enough. So uh, we had to increase that by, I think it's 6.34% overall, because the two by four is, you know, twice as much as it used to be and everything else. So uh, in dealing with, um, you know, nationwide shortages of materials and construction costs increasing, that, that folds into it as well. So values are going up to insure, numbers of insurers going down, and, and it's just, it's not a great market to even push back really in any way, because there's not a lot you can push back on. 
Any other questions, colleagues? If not, I just want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Gay, man, this is uh, the first time that I can remember being on the board that we're going to pass a budget before the new year. That's a big deal. We're getting there. Yeah, yeah ma'am. <laughs> so thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. We're now, we're now on to uh, item 4.2, uh, request to award invitation to bid number 23-CN-0002, milk for the Child Nutrition Program fiscal year 2022-2023. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board accepts the only bid received uh, meeting the specifications for the invitation to bid number 23-CN-0002 for the milk for the Child Nutrition Program for the fiscal year 2022-2023 from Eastside, Jersey, Dairy, Prairie Farm, uh, Prairie Farm, excuse me, in the amount of $199,125.20. May I have a motion uh, to move item 4.2 to the full board? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Eames, is there a second? Second. I have a second by Mrs. Ervigan. Uh, are there any board comments? Is there any public comments? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, uh, will you, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, therefore, that, that item will be uh, placed on Thursday's agenda for consideration of the full board. Moving on to 4.3, uh, request to award invitation to bid number 23-CN-0003, uh, paper products for the Child Nutrition Program Fiscal year 2022-2023, it's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the only bid received meeting the specifications for paper products for the Child Nutrition Program for fiscal year 2022-2023 from Economical Janitorial in Paper Supplies, LLC. The total amount of this award is $206,639.85. I have a motion to move item 4.3 to the full board for consideration. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Seams. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Wagner Romero. Uh, any public comment? Any board comment? Hearing none, seeing none. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, and that item moves on to the full board for consideration on Thursday's meeting. Uh, moving on to item 4.4, request to award invitation to bid number 23-CN-0004, uh, canned goods and staples for the Child Nutrition Program fiscal year 2022-2023. It's recommended that Orleans Parish School Board accepts the low bid meeting specifications for invitation to bid number 23-CN-0004, canned goods and staples for the Child Nutrition Program for the fiscal year 2022-2023 um, from Gorsh uh, Wholesale Grocers in the amount of $175,915.50. Uh, I may have a motion to move item 4.4 to the full board for consideration. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Eames. Is there a second? Yeah, second. Second by Mr. Zervigan. Uh, I see no public comment. I hear no board comment. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries uh, for full consideration for the, for, for the board on Thursday's meeting. Moving to 4.5, uh, request to award proposal number 22-0048 for Financial Municipal Advisory Services. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the proposal meeting the specification terms and conditions for the Financial uh, Municipal Advisory Services from PFM Financial Advisors, LLC, in the amount of $150,000 for a period of one year with an option to renew for two additional one-year periods subject to the board approval and authorize the general counsel to prepare a contract for signatures of the board president uh, and the contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.5 to the full board? Yes, I have a, a motion by Ms. Zervigan, a second by Ms. Eames. Uh, is there any 
Uh, seeing that there is no public comment, no board comment, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, that item moves on uh, to the full board for consideration. Uh, we're now at item 4.6, uh, request for uh, approval of change order number eight for Gibbs construction for the Rosenwald renovation project. It is recommended that Orleans Parish School Board accepts the change order increase from Gibbs construction in the amount of $18,000. $77 for the Rosenwald re renovation project. And I have a motion to move item 4.6 for the full board. So moved. I have a motion by Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero. Is there a second? Second. A second by Ms. Eames. Uh, seeing that there's no uh, public comment, I don't hear any board comment. All in favor, please <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries to the full board for consideration on Thursday's meeting. Moving on to item 4.7, request to award invitation to bid number 22-FAC-0031 for chiller replacement at Robert Moton North Kenilworth Elementary School. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board accepts the bid from Goatee Construction uh, um, Incorporation uh, in the amount of $241,000 for the chiller replacement at Robert Moton uh, Elementary School and authorize the general counsel to prepare a contract for signatures of the board president in the contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.7 to the full board for consideration? Yes, so moved. I have a motion by Mr. Zervagon. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero. Seeing that there are no public comments, are there any board comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. That item will move on to uh, the full board for consideration at Thursday's meeting. Uh, we're now at item 4.8. Uh, First Amendment to contract with educators for quality alternatives for a restorative practices program for middle school students. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the First Amendment to the contract with educators for quality alternatives for a restorative practice program for middle school students uh, to increase the contract price by $200,000 for a new total of $950,000 and authorizes the general count, uh, counsel to repair <clears throat> the contract amendment for signatures of the board president and contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.8 to the full board for consideration? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Eames. Is there a second? Yes, second. Second by Mr. Zervagon. Seeing that there is no public comment and hearing no board comment, um, I'll move on to the vote. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. And that I will move on to the full board for consideration at Thursday's meeting. Moving to 4.9, First Amendment to contractor with Fourth Sector Solutions for Innovation Program Services. It is recommended the Orleans Parish School Board approves the First Amendment to the contract with Fourth Circuit Sector. Excuse me, Fourth Circuit, Fourth <laughs> Sector Solutions. I'll say that fast for in Innovation Program Services to renew the contract for a one year and the amount and the total amount of $115,000 from March 1st, 2022 to February 28th, 2023 and authorize the general counsel to repair the contract amendment for signatures of the board president and contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.9 to the full board for consideration? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Seams. Is there a second? Second. I have a second by Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero. Uh, Seeing that there's no public comment, hearing no board comment, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. That item will be considered uh, at our Thursday board meeting. Moving to item 4.10, <coughs> second amendment to contract uh, with uh, Coben uh Occupant, excuse me, Occupant, uh, for professional development services for trauma-informed practices. Uh, it is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the second amendment to the contract with Occupant for 
uh, Professional Development Services for Trauma-Informed Practices renewing the contract for one year in the total amount not to exceed uh, $300,000 and authorize the general counsel to prepare the contract uh, amendment for signatures of the board president uh, along with the contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.10 to the full board for consideration? Yes, so moved. Uh, I have a motion by Mr. Zervagon. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President Dr. Wagner Merrill. Uh, seeing that there is no public comments, hearing no board comments, I'll go to the vote. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, item 4.10 will be moving on to the full board for consideration at Thursday's board meeting. Moving to item 4.11, first amendment to the contract uh, with the new teacher project, TNTP, for professional development, teaching, recruitment, and training. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the first amendment to the contract with the new teacher project, TNTP, for professional development, teacher, recruitment, and training, increasing the contract amount by $288,000 and authorizes the general counsel to prepare the contract amendment for signatures of the board president and contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.11 to the full board for consideration? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Eames there. Second. So move. <laughs> he means second. Uh, so I have a motion by Ms. Eames. I have a second by Mr. Marshall. Is there any public comment? Seeing no public comment, hearing no board comment, uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Hearing none, that motion carries, uh, and that item will be considered by the full board uh, on Thursday's board meeting. We're now at item 4.12, excuse me, First Amendment to the contract with Teach for America, TFA for Professional Development, Teacher Recruitment and Training. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the First Amendment to the contract with Teach for America for professional development, teacher recruitment, and training, increasing the contract amount by $225,000 and authorizes the general counsel to prepare the contract amendment for signatures of the board president and contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.12 to the bull board for consideration? So move. I have a motion by Ms. Eames. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Marshall. Uh, seeing that there's no public comment, hearing no board comment. I have a quick question, actually. Oh, okay, question. Mr. Gay, could you elaborate a little bit more on, on 4.12? So I see that we are approving, we would be approving um, an increase to the original that, that's correct. That so this this series of, of contract uh, amendments is all related to the increase in system-wide needs program. Yeah. Okay. So at last month's meeting, we went through the, the list of what gotcha. that budget would look you. like, and then these are the subsequent contract amendments. So I should have said that during the presentation of what all these were, but these are all related to system-wide needs program. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's move to the vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing none, uh, that motion carries on to the full board for consideration. We are now at item 4.13, approval of LSU mm. Health Services contract for public health services. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves a contract for public health services as provided by LSU Health Sciences for the 2022-2023 school year as part of NOLA Public Schools' ongoing response to COVID-19. May I have a motion to move item 4.13 to the full board for consideration? Yes, so moved. I have a motion by Mrs. Zervigan. Is there a second? Second. I have a second by Vice President Wagner, Dr. Wagner Romero. Uh, <clears throat> seeing that there is no public comment, hearing no board comment in this moment, I'm going to call for the vote. Um, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposition. Uh, that motion carries. That item will be considered uh, at Thursday's board meeting. Uh, let's move to item 4.14. Renewal of contract with Break Free Education for Education and Wraparound Services. 
It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the one-year renewal of the contract with Break Free Education to provide education and select wraparound services to students at the Travis Hill Schools for the period of July 1, 2022 uh, through June 30th, 2023 uh, at an increased amount of $1 million and authorizes the General Counsel to prepare the contract for renewal uh, for signature of the Board Council, uh, excuse me, Board President and Contractor. May I have a motion uh, to move item 4.14 uh, to the full board for consideration? So moved. Uh, I have a motion by Ms. Eames. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Wagner uh, Romero. Uh, seeing that there are no public comments, uh, are there any board comments? Seeing none, call for the vote. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, that item will be moved on to the full board for consideration at Thursday's meeting. Uh, we are now at item 4.15, renewal contract with the Learning Collective for charter uh, application renewal services. Recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the one-year renewal of the contract with the Learning Collective for type one and type three charter application review services for the period of July 1, 2022. Uh, through June 30th, 2023, at an amount not to exceed $103,841 and authorizes the general counsel to prepare the contract renewal for signature of the board, president, and contractor. May I have a motion to move item 4.15 to the full board for consideration. Yes, so moved. Yeah, or second, either way. <laughs> Whatever you need. I have a, a motion by Ms. Eves, a, a second by uh, Mr. Zervigan. Uh, I don't see any public comment in this moment, and I'm not hearing any board comment. Uh, all in favor, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, that item will be considered uh, at Thursday's board meeting. We're now at item 4.16, uh, resolution 10-22, uh, levying constitutional and other dedicated millages 2023. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board adopts uh, resolution 10-22, setting forth the designating constitutional mills and other dedicated mills on all property subject to taxation in the parish of Orleans, state of Louisiana for the year of 2023. May I have a motion to move items uh, 4.16, uh, excuse me, to the full board for consideration. Yes, I moved. I have a motion by Mrs. Zervigan, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Eames. Seeing that there's no public comment, uh, I don't hear any board comments. Um, I'm going to call for the question. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing no opposition, that motion carries. Uh, it'll be uh, that that item will be considered for the full board uh, as consideration on Thursday's board meeting. We're now at item four. Uh, 4.17, revision to central office salary schedule, FY 2022-2023. It's recommended that the Only Parish School Board approves the 2022-2023 uh, central office salary schedule for central office employees hired uh, before July 1, 2021, grandfathered employees and central office employees hired on or after July 1, 2021. Uh, and approves the retroactive correction to the 2021-2022 grandfather central office employee salary schedule previously approved on July 29, 2021. May have a motion to move item 4.17 to the full board for consideration. So moved. I have a motion by uh, Vice President Dr. Wagner Romero. Is there a second? Yes, second. Second by Mr. Zervigan. Uh, I see no public comment. Any board comment? Hearing none, uh, call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing none, that motion carry. That item will be considered at the full board uh, on Thursday's meeting. Uh, item 4.18, uh, request to renew property casualty and flood insurance premiums expiring in 2022-2023, it's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the renewal of property, boiler, and machinery, equipment down, breakdown, terrorism, physical and liability, general liability, workers, compensation, excessive liability, pollution liability, 
violent malicious acts, cyber liability, and flood insurance policy renewals, and authorizes the board president to sign forms binding coverages effective, effective July 1, 2022 through July 1, 2023. May I have a motion uh, to move item 4.18 to the full board for consideration. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Seems. Is there a second? A second. Second by Mr. Zervagon. Uh, seeing that there is no public comment, uh, is there any board comment? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing no opposition, that motion carries. This item will be considered uh, for Thursday's board meeting. And, we, and we're done. Took a deep that breath. Great. That was good. We did, <laughs> we did good. We're now moving on to uh, items uh, 6 and 6.1, which is our legal and legislative committee items, which is going to be handled by our chair, um, Mr. Zervagon. Thank you. Um, consider applying for your auctioneer's license <laughs> when you're done. That was good. That was good. All right. Um, we are now at the Legal Legislative Committee, item 6.1. We have the First Amendment to the Charter Operating Agreement with Significant Educators, Bethune Elementary Charter School. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the First Amendment to the Charter Operating Agreement with Significant Educators, adding Louisiana School Employees Retirement System, LASERS, as a retirement option for its employees at Mary Bethune Elementary Charter School. May I have a motion to move 6.1 to the full board, please? So move. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion by Mr. Ashley, a second by Dr. Wagner Romero. No, any public comments? No board discussion. Uh, all right. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right, the motion passes and will be on uh, our Thursday agenda. 6.2. School Facility Preservation Program Project Management Memorandum of Understanding. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves template agreements that define the entity responsible and required duties for project management of all school facilities preservation program funded capital projects, which will be completed by all charter management organizations and district owned facilities. May I have a motion to move 6.2 to the full board? So move. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion by Dr. Wagner Romero, a second by Mr. Ashley. Uh, is there any public comment? Is there any board comment? I will call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the ayes have it, and it'll be moved to the Thursday full board meeting. And with that much shorter committee agenda, uh, I will turn it back to Vice President Wagner Romero to um, to adjourn, adjourn our meeting. Thank you, Chairman Zervagon. Um, if I may, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege to uh, say two things. I think Mr. Ashley really hit the nail on the head earlier uh, with the sentiment um, regarding everything that's going on in our communities. I think we're all tired of receiving calls and text messages and seeing things in the newspaper um, about what's what's going on. I won't go into, into detail, but um, I just really want to make sure that the community continues to know that as a board, we continue to stand alongside our communities, but also very recently, um, I believe there was a, an invitation that went out to bring together uh, a few different people or, or groups of people from different parts of government. Um, and I don't think the school board was involved in that. But we have constantly been making calls to action to our city government to come together uh, and get on the same page so that we can work together to improve what needs to be improved in this city. Many of us ran campaigns with the desire to bring different levels of government together to, to find solutions 
to some of the biggest problems in the city. And so this is just, again, a call to action to our fellow elected officials across the city and across the state of Louisiana. It's time for us to come together, sit at the table, and put politics aside to figure out how we move our communities forward, to figure out how we work alongside our communities to make our neighborhoods a safer place to live. Um, I think sometimes people get so wrapped up in the what's going to happen next election cycle. I don't care what's going to happen next election cycle. What I do care about is these children that are getting murdered, these families that are getting murdered. Um, and so I know that my board members, my fellow board members, feel the same exact way. We've got to come together to figure out how to work collaboratively rather than being in our silos to affect change in the city of New Orleans. And so I wanted to say that first. Um, on a lighter note, it is June. So last year, then board president uh, Ashley allowed me for the, I think the first time ever, to make uh, public remarks re regarding LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Um, but I think all of our hearts are, are sort of in disrepair at this moment in terms of what's going on, but I wanted to at least acknowledge and say happy Pride Month to our LGBTQIA++ community members, um, especially after we are seeing gross legislation being passed forth uh, at the state level. Um, just know that we continue to stand alongside you, we continue to champion um, for you and with you, and um, just simply happy Pride Month. <clears throat> Board Member Ashley. Yeah, I just want to also, uh, on the note of celebrations. Oh, you, I think you're taking it from me. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to make sure we, <laughs> we don't slide out of here ahead, without acknowledging uh, the Mary Garden's yes. birthday. I think it'd be very inappropriate to do that. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> she is on the diet, day is on her birthday. Yeah. That is a big deal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Th thank you, Board Member Ashley. Uh, Mr. Marshall, you have some comments? I was, I was, he, he took my thunder. <laughs> on on, on uh, Revolutionary Singing Prince's birthday, I wanted to extend our princess a happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Um, with that, there are no further items on the agenda. May I have a motion to adjourn? The move. All right, it's been moved by Mr. Ashley. A second. Seconded by Mr. Zervagon. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Have a wonderful Tuesday. We will see you all on Thursday.